described by a lot of people today as simply being too white and therefore supremacist. So then that leads to the question, what is uh, Christian supremacy? Uh, and so I will uh, read this little quote um, by an author who bills herself as a queer author. This is what she says. Christian supremacy is that cooperation, I'm sorry, it's that co-optation, that's a word I haven't seen before, it's that co-optation, that taking of Christianity and using it like a wolf in sheep's clothing, using its language, sacred texts, and traditions to cause harm, to perpetuate domination, imperialism, racism, sexism. That mixture, that marriage, that unholy union between power systems of power and religion. We call that Christian supremacy, and that must go. People of faith, like myself, need to take God back from this idea that God is about punishment, death, and harm, particularly against the most marginalized. Part of how we do that is by healing our own religious trauma and the spiritual violence that has been done against us as women, LGBT people, immigrants, and so on. So you can see where it's, you know, which way it's leaning, of course. Um, there are a lot of people who want to make Christianity blend with the culture rather than stand out against the culture. And this is part of it. You know, kind of like a kinder, gentler Jesus. <laughs> uh, and they believe uh, that in doing so, uh, the church is going to become more relevant and it's going to become more loving. Um, and we certainly want to engage our culture with compassion and with grace. But when we shift from what the Bible says to what culture thinks about love, we embark on a journey ending in a moral wasteland. And the Bible makes it very, very clear uh, that loving God and um, loving our neighbor summarizes the law. Jesus himself said that. But our difficulty is not that we love, but that we have a semantical challenge where we replace God's idea of love with our idea of love. So we're redefining again. Uh, and we love the wrong things. Um, today the mantra is, uh, love is love. Have you heard that? Love is love. You know, we confuse love with sex and various expressions of lifestyle. And we forget that after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they didn't stop loving. They just began loving the wrong things. Same thing is true with mankind today. The Bible tells us that we become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We became lovers of ourselves and lovers of things opposed to God. It's easy to fall in love with evil. People do it all the time. But Jesus clarified the whole matter when he said, If you love me, you will do what? Keep my commandments. Um... but this slippery slope of compromise. Now, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but I'm going to name a name here. And if you haven't heard about this, uh, it may disappoint you. Um, and uh, uh, the name, of course, is uh, Max Licato. Now, um, I love uh, Max Licato's books. Uh, I, I, his writing style is beautiful. And, uh, and I uh, got a lot out of his books. I have a lot of his books in my library. Um, but uh, remarks that he made in a sermon a few years back 
uh, was an example of what happens when you bow under pressure. And um, it did make national news. So, you know, it's not like we're speaking out of school here. Um, but he was invited to preach a virtual sermon in 2021 for the National Cathedral in Washington. And LGBTQ groups objected because of the active harm that his views inflicted. Active harm. Uh, and the reason for their objection was that previously in 2004, he spoke and in that message, he rejected same-sex marriage and he affirmed that marriage is a union of a man and a woman in a covenant relationship. Now, the powers that be at the National Cathedral, they didn't withdraw the invitation for uh, Lakato to speak there. Um, they simply apologized later on, saying that they uh, failed to appreciate the depth of the injury. Um, and then four days later, after this all came out, Max Licato issued an apology to the congregation of the National Cathedral and to the LGBTQ community. And this is what he said, and I quote, In 2004, I preached a sermon on the topic of same-sex marriage. I now see that in that sermon, I was disrespectful. I was hurtful. I wounded people in ways that were devastating. I should have done better. It grieves me that my words have hurt or been used to hurt the LGBTQ community. I apologize to you and I ask forgiveness of Christ. Faithful people may disagree about what the Bible says about homosexuality, but we agree that God's holy word must never be used as a weapon to wound others. How disappointing. How disappointing. I, I, don't, I don't know. For the tone. For the tone. Yes. Just for what he said. Uh, he went on to say that although he believes in the traditional biblical understanding of marriage, he also believes in a God of unbounded grace and love, and that LGBTQ individuals are beloved children of God because they are made in the image and likeness of God. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's true in the sense that people have value. All sinners have value. They're made in the image of God. Therefore, they have value. If they didn't have value, we wouldn't be after souls, would we? Okay? So you take something like that and you contrast that with the Apostle Paul. Imagine Paul apologizing for what he wrote to the church in Rome about the condemnation of homosexual relationships in chapter 1 where he said that their behavior as a result of exchanging the truth of God for a lie, is that they worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator, and how that God gave them over to dishonorable passions, and their judgment was certain. He didn't mince any words. Now, yes, it is true, as I said this morning, it is true that all people are created in the image and likeness of God, but that does not excuse or justify sinful conduct. It doesn't. And even though he says God's word must never be used to wound others, the Bible affirms that God often has to wound us before he can heal us. If a surgeon is going to perform a procedure, chances are there's going to be a wound in order for you to get better. Right? True love, biblical love, can hurt even when you truth in love truth at times hurts 
People don't like to be confronted when they're wrong. It makes people angry. It leads to rejection. It can divide. The love of God, which indeed is the chief attribute of God, is compatible with the judgment that comes from rejecting God's ways. Um, truthfully, truthfully, this whole middle ground business, it just doesn't make sense biblically at all. If there are some people on the left who believe that homosexual desires are a gift from God, then the next question is this. If it is a gift from God, then why does he prohibit it? If it is a gift from God, then why does he prohibit them from fulfilling those desires in a relationship? There are, there, there are a lot of people in our world today, in our fallen humanity, that have powerful desires that are not a gift from God. Are the desires of a pedophile a gift from God? Are the desires of uh, a murderer a gift from God? Are the desires of a kleptomaniac uh, a gift from God? And truthfully, folks, rather than having a knee-jerk response of condemnation and tongue-wagging and clicking and that kind of thing. Our heart really needs to go out with people who struggle with their sexual identity and sexual desires that they really don't want to have, but they do have. Uh, and, and we ought to be very quick to listen when they share those struggles, but also compassionate and care uh, helps them understand that we are all part of a fallen and part of a broken world with passions often running amok. And it is better that we tell the truth and be thought to be hateful than to tell lies with a compassionate whisper. Does calling people to repentance produce harm? God's word cuts. Mm -hmm. That's the one. God's word cuts so that it might heal. Uh, it wounds so that it might bind us up. And it devastates us so that it might redeem us. According to Probe Ministries' uh, latest survey of religious views and practices, nearly 70% of those polled who profess to be born-again Christians do not, listen, 70% of those who profess to be Christians in this poll do not believe that Jesus is the only way to God. They were asked whether Muhammad, Buddha, and Jesus all teach valid ways to God, and when asked if they disagreed with that, uh, most said they didn't disagree that they were all valid. The Washington Post carried an article about pastors ditching the evangelical label for something new. And the thing that is new is this whole concept of deconstruction. Deconstruction. You might as well just change the word and just call it destruction. Because that's what it is. Deconstruction is deconstructing Christianity. Taking it down brick by brick by brick and rebuilding it 
so that it looks completely different. Churches continually surrendering to a moral revolution. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And it's easy again for us to be critical. Part of the reason why there's such an emphasis on deconstruction is because there is a generation, a younger generation, not the youngest generation, but somewhere in the middle, there is a younger generation that has been hurt by the church for all the wrong reasons, whether it's legalism or whatever. And they've been hurt not so much because of what we believe, but the attitude with which we believe it. So before we condemn those who engage in deconstruction, we have to ask ourselves, has the church, which includes all of us, has the church done things that have led to the rejection of Christianity by these post-evangelicals? And are we at least partially to blame because we have been uncaring toward those who disagree with us? Hard truths must be carried in soft hearts. And teaching about righteousness should not come from the lips of the self-righteous. If we are not broken and humbled by our own sin, we have no business pointing out the sin of others. It's the whole thing about the speck and the log, right? Right? Let me give you an example. Uh, Monday nights, uh, I have a, a Bible study with our young men, um, 20-somethings. And uh, uh, we've, we've been having a really good time. Uh, there was a new person who came the last time we got together. And... Um, I've known him for quite some time, went to school with my daughter, but uh, he's married now, has children, and um, in all the time that I've known him, he and I have, um, you know, we, we've, uh, we've had sparks back and forth politically. Um, and he has some valid uh, reasons uh, why that uh, why he leans the way that that he does uh, but a lot of it is uh, a lack of knowledge but also um, because of hurt and so therefore there is a lack of trust and you know, his question had to do with how do we and, and for him, this was a question that came light years from where he was. The question now, as a married person and a young father, was uh, how do we raise our children in such a way that we teach them to love all people, um, and yet at the same time, teach them what God says about LGBTQ, this and that, and the other thing. And, and not appear to be contradicting. It was a good question. Now, it would be easy for me to just say, oh, come on. It really is very simple. You know, you love the sinner, you hate the sin. How many times have we heard that? Love the sinner, hate the sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Sounds like a parrot. Um, 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this young man, and it's like, this is the closest that we've ever got. And it's kind of like having the big fish on the end. And you just, you've got to be real careful how you reel that fish in. And so very, very carefully, I'm trying to respond lovingly and trying to also understand where he's coming from and to take comfort myself in realizing that what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing a transformation where all of his left-wing ideology is beginning to crumble in the sand. And I like it. But I'm not about to say, ah, told you so, told you so. So that kind of an example. Uh, close with this quote here. Uh, Penn Gillette. If you ever watch uh, Penn and Teller, you ever watch the Penn and Teller show on TV, Fool Us? But Penn and Teller are some of the world's greatest magicians. They are absolutely incredible. They have their own show. They headline in Las Vegas, uh, and uh, they're world-renowned. Uh, and uh, they have a, a really interesting moniker where um, Penn Jillett is um, the, uh, the guy who does all of the conversing and the talking, and Teller is known for not saying a word. He never speaks. He can speak, but... Part of the moniker is that he's the silent partner and he never speaks. So, Penn and Teller, they have this show. Anyway, that being the case. This is a quote from Penn Gillette. He says, I am an atheist. I don't respect people who don't proselytize. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and that people could be going to hell... How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? That puts it right out there, doesn't it? That really speaks to this whole issue of love, doesn't it? Because if we truly love, we're going to be willing to get beyond the it makes me uncomfortable and I don't know what to say. Right? Because if we truly love like we say we do, you know, and this is the whole reason that he's saying, this is the whole reason I'm an atheist. is because you people that call yourselves Christians, you aren't consistent. You say one thing, but do you ever follow through with it? Not from what I can see. I remember as a kid going to camp and one of the campfire songs, right? That old Indian drumbeat warpath song. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Really? Hmm. It's a crazy world. It's a crazy world. You know, uh, more and more the opportunity comes along for us to uh, simply throw our hands up and wait for the Lord to return. That would be so much easier, wouldn't it? But if we can coax ourselves to see the possibilities being presented amidst the chaos. I think there's a part of me that thinks that if Paul was alive today, he would be thrilled with the opportunities. Thrilled with the opportunities. He certainly would.
Well, dear Father, uh, we have uh, again looked at these things and um, things that are certainly discouraging when we see it happening all around us, but things that don't surprise us, things that should not surprise us, things that are, again, um, opportunities in disguise. So, Lord, help us to redouble our efforts. Help us to, with the patience and with the zeal that we have for people as we profess, um, may they indeed see us desire to engage, to listen, and to show, without compromise, uh, your love to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name.